Retor Political Treatises, On the Orator By Cicero Audiobook 3x18 106 For my part, as I always thought you a god in a god in eloquence, so I have never attributed to you greater praises for oratory than for politeness, which you ought to show on this occasion especially, and not to decline a discussion on which two young men of such excellent ability invite you to enter. 107 I am certainly, replied Crassus, desirous to oblige them, nor shall I think it any trouble to speak briefly, as is my manner, what I think upon any point of the subject. And to their first question, because I do not think it right for me to neglect your admonition, Savola, I answer, that I think there is either no art of speaking at all, or but very little, but that all the disputation about it amongst the learned arises from a difference of opinion about the word. 108 For if art is to be defined according to what Antonius just now asserted, as lying in things thoroughly understood and fully known, such as are abstracted from the caprice of opinion and comprehended in the limits of science, there seems to me to be no art at all in oratory, since all the species of our forensic diction are various, and suited to the common understanding of the people. 109 Yet if those things which have been observed in the practice and method of speaking, have been noted and chronicled by ingenious and skillful men, have been set forth in words, illustrated in their several kinds, and distributed into parts, as I think may possibly be done, I do not understand why speaking may not be deemed an art, if not according to the exact definition of Antonius, at least according to common opinion. But whether it be an art, or merely the resemblance of an art, it is not, indeed, to be neglected, yet we must understand that there are other things of more consequence for the attainment of eloquence. XXIV 110 Antonius then observed, that he was very strongly of opinion with Crassus, for he neither adopted such a definition of art as those preferred who attributed all the powers of eloquence to art, nor did he repudiate it entirely, as most of the philosophers had done. But I imagine, Crassus, added he, that you will gratify these two young men, if you will specify those particulars which you think may be more conducive to oratory than art itself. 111 I will indeed mention them, said he, since I have engaged to do so, but must beg you not to publish my trifling remarks, though I will keep myself under such restraint as not to seem to speak like a master, or artist, but like one of the number of private citizens, moderately versed in the practice of the forum, and not altogether ignorant, not to have offered anything from myself, but to have accidentally fallen in with the course of your conversation. 112 Indeed when I was a candidate for office, I used, at the time of canvassing, to send away Savola from me, telling him I wanted to be foolish, that is, to solicit with flattery, a thing that cannot be done to any purpose unless it be done foolishly, and that he was the only man in the world in whose presence I should least like to play the fool, and yet fortune has appointed him to be a witness and spectator of my folly. One for what is more foolish than to speak about speaking, when speaking itself is never otherwise than foolish, except it is absolutely necessary. 113 Proceed, however, Crassus, said Savola, for I will take upon myself the blame which you fear. XXV. I am, then, of opinion, said Crassus, that nature and genius in the first place contribute most aid to speaking and that to those writers on the art, to whom Antonius just now alluded, it was not skill and method in speaking, but natural talent that was wanting, for there ought to be certain lively powers in the mind and understanding, which may be acute to invent, fertile to explain and adorn, and strong and retentive to remember, 114 and if any one imagines that these powers may be acquired by art, which is false, for it is very well if they can be animated and excited by art, but they certainly cannot by art be engrafted or instilled, since they are all the gifts of nature, what will he say of those qualities which are certainly born with the man himself, volubility of tongue, 
tone of voice, strength of lungs, and a peculiar conformation and aspect of the whole countenance and body? 115 I do not say, that art cannot improve in these particulars, for am not ignorant that what is good may be made better by education, and what is not very good may be in some degree polished and amended but there are some persons so hesitating in their speech, so inharmonious in their tone of voice, or so unwieldy and rude in the air and movements of their bodies, that, whatever power they possess either from genius or art, they can never be reckoned in the number of accomplished speakers. While there are others so happily qualified in these respects, so eminently adorned with the gifts of nature, that they seem not to have been born like other men, but molded by some divinity. 116 It is, indeed, a great task and enterprise for a person to undertake and profess, that while everyone else is silent, he alone must be heard on the most important subjects, and in a large assembly of men, for there is scarcely any one present who is not sharper and quicker to discover defects in the speaker than merits, and thus whatever offends the hearer effaces the recollection of what is worthy of praise. 117 I do not make these observations for the purpose of altogether deterring young men from the study of oratory, even if they be deficient in some natural endowments. For who does not perceive that to see? Sialius, my contemporary, a new man, the mere mediocrity in speaking, which he was enabled to attain, was a great honor? Who does not know that Q? Various, your equal in age, a clumsy, uncouth man, has obtained his great popularity by the cultivation of such faculties as he has? XXVI 118 But as our inquiry regards the complete orator, we must imagine, in our discussion, an orator from whom every kind of fault is abstracted, and who is adorned with every kind of merit. For if the multitude of suits, if th.a. variety of causes, if the rabble and barbarism of the forum, afford room for even the most wretched speakers, we must not, for that reason, take our eyes from the object of out inquiry. In those arts, in which it is not indispensable usefulness that is sought, but liberal amusement for the mind, how nicely, how almost fastidiously, do we judge. For there are no suits or controversies which can force men, though they may tolerate indifferent orators in the forum, to endure also bad actors upon the stage. 119 The orator therefore must take the most studious precaution not merely to satisfy those whom he necessarily must satisfy, but to seem worthy of admiration to those who are at liberty to judge disinterestedly. If you would know what I myself think, I will express to you, my intimate friends, what I have hitherto never mentioned, and thought that I never should mention. To me, those who speak best, and speak with the utmost ease and grace, appear, if they do not commence their speeches with some timidity, and show some confusion in the exordium, to have almost lost the sense of shame, though it is impossible that such should not be the case, 124 the better qualified a man is to speak, the more he fears the difficulties of speaking, the uncertain success of a speech, and the expectation of the audience. But he who can produce and deliver nothing worthy of his subject, nothing worthy of the name of an orator, nothing worthy the attention of his audience, seems to me, though he be ever so confused while he is speaking, to be downright shameless, for we ought to avoid a character for shamelessness, not by testifying shame, but by not doing that which does not become us. 121 But the speaker who has no shame, as I see to be the case with many, I regard as deserving, not only of rebuke, but of personal castigation. Indeed, what I often observe in you I very frequently experience in myself, that I turn pale in the outset of my speech, and feel a tremor through my whole thoughts, as it were, and limbs. When I was a young man, I was on one occasion so timid in commencing an accusation, that I owed to Q. Maximus the greatest of obligations for immediately dismissing the assembly, as soon as he saw me absolutely disheartened and incapacitated through fear. 
122 here they all signified assent, looked significantly at one another, and began to talk together, for there was a wonderful modesty in Crassus, which however was not only no disadvantage to his oratory, but even an assistance to it, by giving it the recommendation of probity, XXVII. Antonius soon after said, I have often observed, as you mention, Crassus, that both you and other most accomplished orators, although in my opinion none was ever equal to you, have felt some agitation in entering upon their speeches. When I inquired into the reason of this, and considered why a speaker, the more ability he possessed, felt the greater fear in speaking, I found that there were two causes of such timidity. One, that those whom experience 123 and nature had formed for speaking, well knew that the event of a speech did not always satisfy expectation even in the greatest orators, and thus, as often as they spoke, they feared, not without reason, that what sometimes happened might happen then, 124 the other, of which I am often in the habit of complaining, is, that men, tried and approved in other arts, if they ever do anything with less success than usual, are thought either to have wanted inclination for it, or to have failed in performing what they knew how to perform from ill health. Rossius, they say, would not act today, or, he was indisposed. But if any deficiency is seen in the orator, it is thought to proceed from want of sense, 125 and want of sense admits of no excuse because nobody is supposed to have wanted sense because he was indisposed, or because such was his inclination. Thus we undergo a severe judgment in oratory, and judgment is pronounced upon us as often as we speak, if an actor is once mistaken in an attitude, he is not immediately considered to be ignorant of attitude in general, but if any fault is found in a speaker, there prevails forever, or at least for a very long time a notion of his stupidity. XXVIII. 126 But in what you observed, as to there being many things in which, unless the orator has a full supply of them from nature, he cannot be much assisted by a master I agree with you entirely, and, in regard to that point, I have always expressed the highest approbation of that eminent teacher, Apollonius of Alabanda, who, though he taught for pay, would not suffer such as he judged could never become orators, to lose their labor with him, and he sent them away with exhortations and encouragements to each of them to pursue that peculiar art for which he thought him naturally qualified. 127 To the acquirement of other arts it is sufficient for a person to resemble a man, and to be able to comprehend in his mind, and retain in his memory, what is instilled, or, if he is very dull, inculcated into him, no volubility of tongue is requisite, no quickness of utterance, none of those things which we cannot form for ourselves, aspect, countenance, look, voice. 128 But in an orator, the acuteness of the logicians, the wisdom of the philosophers, the language almost of poetry, the memory of lawyers, the voice of tragedians the gesture almost of the best actors, is required. Nothing therefore is more rarely found among mankind than a consummate orator, for qualifications which professors of other arts are commended for acquiring in a moderate degree, each in his respective pursuit, will not be praised in the orator, unless they are all combined in him in the highest possible excellence. 129 Yet observe, said Crassus, how much more diligence is used in one of the light and trivial arts than in this, which is acknowledged to be of the greatest importance, for I often hear Rossius say, that he could never yet find a scholar that he was thoroughly satisfied with, not that some of them were not worthy of approbation, but because, if they had any fault, he himself could not endure it. Nothing indeed is so much noticed, or makes an impression of such lasting continuance on the memory, as that in which you give any sort of offence. 130 To judge therefore of the accomplishments of the orator by comparison with this stage player, do you not observe how everything is done by him unexceptionably, 
everything with the utmost grace, everything in such a way as is becoming, and as moves and delights all? He has accordingly long attained such distinction, that in whatever pursuit a man excels, he is called a Rossius in his art. For my own part, while I desire this finish and perfection in an orator, of which I fall so far short myself, I act audaciously, for I wish indulgence to be granted to myself, while I grant none to others, for I think that he who has not abilities, who is faulty in action, who, in short, wants a graceful manner, should be sent off, as Apollonius advised, to that for which he has a capacity. XXIX 131 Would you then, said Sulpicius, desire me, or our friend Cotta, to learn the civil law, or the military art? For who can ever possibly arrive at that perfection of yours, that high excellence in every accomplishment? It was, replied Crassus, because I knew that there was in both of you excellent and noble talents for oratory, that I have expressed myself fully on these matters, nor have I adapted my remarks more to deter those who had not abilities, than to encourage you who had, and though I perceive in you both consummate capacity and industry, yet I may say that the advantage of personal appearance, on which I have perhaps said more than the Greeks are wont to say, are in you, Sulpicius, even godlike. 132 For any person better qualified for this profession by gracefulness of motion, by his very carriage and figure, or by the fullness and sweetness of his voice, I think that I have never heard speak, endowments which those, to whom they are granted by nature in an inferior degree, may yet succeed in managing, in such measure as they possess them, with judgment and skill, and in such a manner as not to be unbecoming for that is what is chiefly to be avoided, and concerning which it is most difficult to give any rules for instruction, not only for me, who talk of these matters like a private citizen, but even for Rossius himself, whom I often hear say, that the most essential part of art is to be becoming, which yet is the only thing that cannot be taught by art. 133 But, if it is agreeable, let us change the subject of conversation, and talk like ourselves a little, not like rhetoricians. By no means, said Cotta, for we must now entreat you, since you retain us in this study, and do not dismiss us to any other pursuit, to tell us something of your own abilities, whatever they are, in speaking, for we are not inordinately ambitious, we are satisfied with that mediocrity of eloquence of yours and what we inquire of you is, that we may not attain more than that humble degree of oratory at which you have arrived, what you think, since you say that the endowments to be derived from nature are not very deficient in us, we ought to endeavor to acquire in addition. Triple X 134 Crassus, smiling, replied, What do you think is wanting to you, Kata, but a passionate inclination, and a sort of ardor like that of love, without which no man will ever attain anything great in life, and especially such distinction as you desire? Yet I do not see that you need any encouragement to this pursuit, indeed, as you press rather hard even upon me, I consider that you burn with an extraordinarily fervent affection for it. 135 But I am aware that a desire to reach any point avails nothing unless you know what will lead and bring you to the mark at which you aim. Since therefore you lay but a light burden upon me, and do not question me about the whole art of the orator, but about my own ability, little as it is, I will set before you a course, not very obscure, or very difficult, or grand, or imposing, the course of my own practice, which I was accustomed to pursue when I had opportunity, in my youth, to apply to such studies. 136 O day much wished for by us, Cotta! exclaimed Sulpicius, for what I could never obtain, either by entreaty or stratagem or scrutiny, so that I was unable, not only to see what Crassus did, with a view to meditation or composition, but even to gain a notion of it from his secretary and reader, Diphilus, I hope we have now secured, 
and that we shall learn from himself all that we have long desired to know. XXXI 137 I conceive, however, proceeded Crassus, that when you have heard me, you will not so much admire what I have said, as think that, when you desired to hear, there was no good reason for your desire, for I shall say nothing abstruse, nothing to answer your expectation, nothing either previously unheard by you, or new to anyone. In the first place, I will not deny that, as becomes a man well born and liberally educated, I learned those trite and common precepts of teachers in general, 138 first, that it is the business of an orator to speak in a manner adapted to persuade, Next, that every speech is either upon a question concerning a matter in general, without specification of persons or times, or concerning a matter referring to certain persons and times. 139 But that, in either case, whatever falls under controversy, the question with regard to it is usually, whether such a thing has been done, or, if it has been done, of what nature it is or by what name it should be called, or, as some add, whether it seems to have been done rightly or not. 140 That controversies arise also on the interpretation of writing, in which anything has been expressed ambiguously or contradictorily or so that what is written is at variance with the writer's evident intention, and that there are certain lines of argument adapted to all these cases. 141 But that of such subjects as are distinct from general questions, part come under the head of judicial proceedings, part under that of deliberations, and that there is a third kind which is employed in praising or censuring particular persons. That there are also certain common places on which we may insist in judicial proceedings, in which equity is the object, others, which we may adopt in deliberations all which are to be directed to the advantage of those to whom we give counsel, others in panegyric, in which all must be referred to the dignity of the persons commended. 142 That since all the business and art of an orator is divided into five parts, he ought first to find out what he should say, next, to dispose and arrange his matter, not only in a certain order, but with a sort of power and judgment, then to clothe and deck his thoughts with language, then to secure them in his memory, and lastly, to deliver them with dignity and grace. 143 I had learned and understood also, that before we enter upon the main subject, the minds of the audience should be conciliated by an exordium, next, that the case should be clearly stated, then, that the point in controversy should be established, then, that what we maintain should be supported by proof, and that whatever was said on the other side should be refuted, and that, in the conclusion of our speech, whatever was in our favor should be amplified and enforced, and whatever made for our adversaries should be weakened and invalidated. XXXII 144 I had heard also what is taught about the costume of a speech in regard to which it is first directed that we should speak correctly and in pure Latin, next, intelligibly and with perspicuity, then gracefully, then suitably to the dignity of the subject, and as it were becomingly, and I had made myself acquainted with the rules relating to every particular. 145 Moreover, I had seen art applied to those things which are properly endowments of nature, for I had gone over some precepts concerning action, and some concerning artificial memory, which were short indeed, but requiring much exercise, matters on which almost all the learning of those artificial orators is employed, and if I should say that it is of no assistance, I should say what is not true, for it conveys some hints to admonish the orator, as it were, to what he should refer each part of his speech and to what points he may direct his view, so as not to wander from the object which he has proposed to himself. 146 But I consider that with regard to all precepts the case is this, not that orators by adhering to them have obtained distinction in eloquence, but that certain persons have noticed what men of eloquence practiced of their own accord, and formed rules accordingly, so that eloquence has not sprung from art, but art from eloquence. Not that, 
as I said before, I entirely reject art, for it is, though not essentially necessary to oratory, yet proper for a man of liberal education to learn. 147 And by you, my young friends, some preliminary exercise must be undergone, though indeed you are already on the course, but those who are to enter upon a race, and those who are preparing for what is to be done in the forum, as their field of battle, may alike previously learn, and try their powers, by practicing in sport. 148 That sort of exercise, said Sulpicius, is just what we wanted to understand, but we desire to hear more at large what you have briefly and cursorily delivered concerning art, though such matters are not strange even to us. Of that subject, however, we shall inquire hereafter, at present we wish to know your sentiments on exercise. XXXIII 149 I like that method, replied Crassus, which you are accustomed to practice, namely, to lay down a case similar to those which are brought on in the forum, and to speak upon it, as nearly as possible, as if it were a real case. But in such efforts the generality of students exercise only their voice, and not even that skillfully, and try their strength of lungs, and volubility of tongue, and please themselves with a torrent of their own words, in which exercise what they have heard deceives them, that men by speaking succeed in becoming speakers. 154 It is truly said also, that men by speaking badly make sure of becoming bad speakers. In those exercises, therefore, although it be useful even frequently to speak on the sudden, yet it is mere advantageous, after taking time to consider, to speak with greater preparation and accuracy. But the chief point of all is that which, to say the truth, we hardly ever practice, for it requires great labor, which most of us avoid, I mean, to write as much as possible. Writing is said to be the best and most excellent modeler and teacher of oratory, and not without reason, for if what is meditated and considered easily surpasses sudden and extemporary speech, a constant and diligent habit of writing will surely be of more effect than meditation and consideration itself. 151 Since all the arguments relating to the subject on which we write, whether they are suggested by art, or by a certain power of genius and understanding, will present themselves, and occur to us, while we examine and contemplate it in the full light of our intellect, and all the thoughts and words, which are the most expressive of their kind, must of necessity come under and submit to the keenness of our judgment while writing and a fair arrangement and collocation of the words is effected by writing, in a certain rhythm and measure, not poetical, but oratorical. 152 Such are the qualities which bring applause and admiration to good orators, nor will any man ever attain them, unless after long and great practice in writing, however resolutely he may have exercised himself in extemporary speeches and he who comes to speak after practice in writing brings this advantage with him, that though he speak at the call of the moment, yet what he says will bear a resemblance to something written, and if ever, when he comes to speak, he brings anything with him. In writing, the rest of his speech, when he departs from what is written, will flow on in a similar strain. 153 As, when a boat has once been impelled forward, Though the rowers suspend their efforts, the vessel herself still keeps her motion and course during the intermission of the impulse and force of the oars, so, in a continued stream of oratory, when written matter fails, the rest of the speech maintains a similar flow, being impelled by the resemblance and force acquired from what was written. XXXIV 154 But in my daily exercises I used, when a youth, to adopt chiefly that method which I knew that Caius Carbo, my adversary, generally practiced, which was, that, having selected some nervous piece of poetry, or read over such a portion of a speech as I could retain in my memory, I used to declaim upon what I had been reading in other words, chosen with all the judgment that I possessed. But at length I perceived that in that method there was this inconvenience, that Aeneas, 
if I exercised myself on his verses, or Gracchus, if I laid one of his orations before me, had forestalled such words as were peculiarly appropriate to the subject, and such as were the most elegant and altogether the best, so that, if I used the same words, it profited nothing, if others, it was even prejudicial to me, as I habituated myself to use such as were less eligible. 155 Afterwards I thought proper, and continued the practice at a rather more advanced age, to translate the orations of the best Greek orators, by fixing upon which I gained this advantage, that while I rendered into Latin what I had read in Greek, I not only used the best words, and yet such as were of common occurrence, but also formed some words by imitation, which would be new to our countrymen, taking care, however, that they were unobjectionable. 156 As to the exertion and exercise of the voice, of the breath, of the whole body, and of the tongue itself, they do not so much require art as labor, but in those matters we ought to be particularly careful whom we imitate and whom we would wish to resemble. Not only orators are to be observed by us, but even actors, lest by vicious habits we contract any awkwardness or ungracefulness. 157 The memory is also to be exercised, by learning accurately by heart as many of our own writings, and those of others, as we can. In exercising the memory, too, I shall not object if you accustom yourself to adopt that plan of referring to places and figures which is taught in treatises on the art. 1. Your language must then be brought forth from this domestic and retired exercise, into the midst of the field, into the dust and clamor, into the camp and military array of the forum, you must acquire practice in everything, you must try the strength of your understanding, and your retired lucubrations must be exposed to the light of reality. 158 The poets must also be studied, an acquaintance must be formed with history, the writers and teachers in all the liberal arts and sciences must be read, and turned over, and must, for the sake of exercise, be praised, interpreted, corrected, censured, refuted, you must dispute on both sides of every question, and whatever may seem maintainable on any point, must be brought forward and illustrated. 159 The civil law must be thoroughly studied, laws in general must be understood, all antiquity must be known, the usages of the Senate, the nature of our government, the rights of our allies, our treaties, and convention, and whatever concerns the interests of the state, must be learned. A certain intellectual grace must also be extracted from every kind of refinement, with which, as with salt, every oration must be seasoned. I have poured forth to you all I had to say, and perhaps any citizen whom you had laid hold of in any company whatever, would have replied to your inquiries on these subjects equally well. XXXV 160 When Crassus had uttered these words a silence ensued. But though enough seemed to have been said in the opinion of the company present, in reference to what had been proposed, yet they thought that he had concluded his speech more abruptly than they could have wished. Savola then said, What is the matter, Cotta? Why are you silent? Does nothing more occur to you which you would wish to ask Crassus? 161 Nay, rejoined he, that is the very thing of which I am thinking for the rapidity of his words was such, and his oration was winged with such speed, that though I perceived its force and energy I could scarcely see its track and course, and, as if I had come into some rich and well-furnished house, where the furniture was not unpacked, nor the plate set out, nor the pictures and statues placed in view, but a multitude of all these magnificent things laid up and heaped together, so just. Now, in the speech of Crassus, I saw his opulence and the riches of his genius, through veils and curtains as it were, but when I desired to take a nearer view, there was scarcely opportunity for taking a glance at them, I can therefore neither say that I am wholly ignorant of what he possesses, nor that I have plainly ascertained and beheld it. 162 Then, said Savola, why do you not act in the same way as you would do? 
if you had really come into a house or villa full of rich furniture. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.